Hi, this is Axel, Axel Merck, the President and Chief Investment Officer of Merck Investments with our latest Fed chart book. We prepared the charts just before the elections. I'm talking just after the midterm elections, but before the Federal Reserve actually releases its minutes. That's for context. And these charts, as always, are prepared by Nick. I give my in-between the line readings. Um, get the PDF at MerckInvestments.com forward slash research, where you can also get Nick's analysis as well as premium charts. Um, you can read these things here in detail about what the mandate is. I'll reference these things here in between. Um, one comment here on, and by the way, the, as, as many of you are aware, the blue analysis in the bottom, that's Nick's analysis, so my opinion might uh, differ from that. Um, the Fed's normal longer-term range is kind of what the Fed indicates it is. I'm not so sure whether they actually truly believe that or whether they say that, um, because they think that's the appropriate thing to say. Um, and that might just be, be mincing words here a little bit. But in any case, um, rates have obviously been steadily uh, going higher in the so-called gradual pace every other meeting. Noteworthy to say, Polos, the head of the Bank of Canada, has made very strong points in recent weeks that he does not believe in the word gradual. He does not want the market to think rate hikes can only happen every other meeting. Now, obviously, he's referring to Canada, uh, but just giving you a flavor of what's happening around the world. And as far as, as Paul is concerned, those of you who have listened to me here on these on these analyses before know that I believe he's a lawyer, not a monetary economist. I don't just believe that. That's the fact. But the implication of that is that um, that. Powell does not have a quote-unquote agenda. Um, he doesn't go out on a limp to 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 impose a monetary view um, as uh, as uh, Bernanke was the student of the Great Depression and knew how to do QE. And uh, Yellen was a labor economist. Now that said, the one thing that is a leftover from the Yellen years in particular is the staff. Um, Powell relies on on researcher economists. Um, at the Fed. Um, they're quite Keynesian. They are quite influenced by Yellen because she's obviously been there and shaped and helped form the sort of research that comes out from that. So that's just as a as a background. But all that said, I do believe the Fed will be lagging and not be preemptive. Um, preemptive, the, the most recent Fed chair that was quote-unquote preemptive is, is pretty much a unique one, was Greenspan, who would um, at times go out on a limp because of what he thinks that would happen. Um, let me go here into market expectations of what's going to happen. Um, this chart here shows market expectation what's priced in a year from now. So obviously continued rate hikes. Um, I like this chart here, and I'll, I'll stay here for a moment. Um, this chart shows how many rate hikes are priced in for 2018 and 19 combined. So that means at the end of 2019, based on the Fed Funds futures, we will be 1.48% higher than at the beginning of 2018. And the point of this chart here is that rate expectations have been gradually rising for the end of 2019. Um, this is the second year, 2017 was the first year in many, many years that rate hike expectations at the end of the year were higher than at the beginning of the year, obviously assuming that will continue to be, be high up there. As I indicated, we, we created these, these charts the evening before um, the midterm elections. As I'm talking, the, the day um, after the, um, the, the midterm election, the rate hike expectations have moved higher, um, a little bit higher. Um, there was some talk in the, in the news coverage on the midterm election that um, bonds rallied, the yields came down. That's the long end of the yield curve. Uh, these rate hike expectations are the short end of the yield curve, specifically until 2019. And basically, what this suggests is that the Fed is going to continue to march higher. Nothing has come out from the midterm election that, that would would tell them otherwise, at least as of as of now, nothing has come out. Um, and uh, and that's kind of expected when you have gridlock in Congress, that you're not going to get all that much done, which means the policy in place are going to continue. Um, obviously, there's going to be noise, maybe increased noise, be that from the tweeter in chief or be that from committees that are going to investigate the tweeter in chief. And I'm, I'm not trying to, to pick sides here. I consider myself an equal opportunity offender when it comes to politics. Um, but We'll see the um, we'll see the the, the 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 normal course of business in in many ways continue. And what that means is that we have a fiscal stimulus in place. We continue to have a monetary policy 
a stimulus in place. It, it, it's worthwhile emphasizing that despite rates hikes having gone higher, uh, we've taken the foot uh, quite a bit off the gas pedal of the accelerator, but we have not slammed on the brakes. Um, at the same time, we do have fiscal stimulus happening in Europe. Um, and the only significant head, well, two headwinds, one eventual headwind is that some of the fiscal stimulus will, will wear off. But the other one, um, the other headwind, of course, can and is coming from trade. Uh, as a reminder, the U.S. economy is much less dependent on trade than, than the rest of the world is. And I'll go into that here in a second on, on some other chart. Let me move on here. Inflation reading. Um, that's obviously what the Fed is supposed to focus on um, is inflation. Uh, inflation readings have been coming in all right. But we're at 2%, right? We're at 2% and the target is at 2%. Now, there. There's a lot of noise in these data, and but at the same time, should you really be pushing the accelerator um, when when you are at two percent? Um, Market-based ex uh, exp uh, inflation expectations similar around two percent, and then the Fed likes to look at the survey-based ones. And the difference is that the main difference is, as you can see just by eyeballing them, they're not as volatile and to to expand on this and i've i've done this before um the survey based one is really what what powell references and you see on these charts some quotes from powell um powell is actually very transparent in his policy and you can just read him um he says one of the reasons we can kind of afford inflation to go a tad higher is because inflation expectations are anchored, which means that if they were to go higher than 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 two percent or a tad above our target, there is confidence that we can do the right thing to take them down again. But if you flip that on its head, that means that the Fed will likely run allow inflation to run higher and only react late. And to the corollary for me is that. Well, this means that this economy may overheat. This means the Fed will hike to ha have to hike further, which means the the um, this economy is going to die the same death as many economic cycles do. Meaning, with a Fed hiking into a slowing um, economy, especially a Fed that is looking at data at the hindsight. Um, and, and so that's kind of my framework in this environment. And by the way, the best way to play this, to invest in that, is in the rates market itself. You can talk to us if you want to learn how to do that. Um, it's not for, for, for everybody because obviously most people just focus on equities and fixed income um, in, the, in the long end, uh, the real curve, but you can also take positions on the shorter end. Unemployment rate and wages. Um, here's a chart that wage pressures are finally picking up. Um, for, and the, um, the, these are the average, average, um, hourly earnings. Now, this is not the employment cost index, which might be a Tad better measure even, but still that the trend is the same. Wage pressures are finally happening, and uh, they had, uh, and and here at the same time employment goes right. right. So you, you put the two and two together and tell me what's going to happen. Um, there's, a, there's several measures on employment here. Um, job gains look good. Not only do they look good, it is mathematically impossible not to get inflation if that sort of job gain growth will continue. Now what's likely to happen at some point is that the job gains will slow and it's not necessarily because the economy will slow um, but it is because there are just not enough workers available and at that stage wage pressures are going to increase in more earnest now obviously there are other reasons why why um why um job growth might might slow down this is the so-called jolts report um a favorite of of Yellen, she wants to see kind of um, uh, what uh, what the quit rate is in the market, how motivated people are in the market. Um, the prime age labor participation rate. So this is how many workers on the 25 to 54 year old are in the labor force. The good economy has been pulling people back in. That said, the long term trend is down. Note the previous chart was prime age in general. This one is prime age male participation rate. Um, we focus on the males here because they are obviously in the female labor force um, with women joining the labor force and uh, in the in the in the sixties and seventies there there's a lot of uh, variations in this. This shows the long term trend that the participation rate had been going down. Um, and one of the reasons, there are two reasons. Well, one might be economic cycles, right? When 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 the economy isn't doing so well, then um, fewer men or 
people in general on the labor force and the recent good economy has pushed that that rate up. One reason for the long-term decline may well be increased social benefits when you have an incentive, I put that in quotes, is there not to be in the labor force, then, well, guess what? Then you're not in the labor force when, when, you get, um, when you get disability and whatnot. The opioid crisis might have an influence with that and whatnot. Still, um, the, the big question is how many people are there on the sidelines before we get inflationary pressures because we've exhausted that pool of folks on the sidelines in the prime age pool. Um, we've put in this dashed line because we think this may well be something that Powell may be, may be looking at. And I've mentioned in the past, this dashed line is not put in there too scientifically. It's just a, to, to eyeball, are we, are, we, are we getting there? Are we reaching the end of what we can draw from the sidelines? Nobody really knows. Uh, based on our assessment of Powell, this is one thing he might be um, he might be watching. And, and by the way, we are also not showing here the, the folks above 60. Uh, clearly, we, we are healthier, we live longer, and so there are some other structural changes happening in the labor market. But this is still a, a good way, in my view at least, to, to see what Powell is thinking and, and also what, what I'm thinking. Um, financial conditions. This may be extremely important with regard to how the Fed is looking at the markets. Um, a market correction, the S&P going down 10%, even 20%, does not necessarily get Powell to move. And it wouldn't have gotten others to move either, except that, of course, you're always in a different environment, right? In 2008, it was most important um, to, to look at the stock market, not so much because the stock market was so important, but the stock market was a reflection of financial conditions. The market crashed um, when credit markets seized up, right? And so this doesn't happen right now. Um, credit markets are working just fine. Um, access to credit is abundant. Uh, Nick has pointed out that that in some ways banks are doing the work of the Fed. And that's that's been kind of one of the big issues with the way that the, the Fed works with these huge balance sheets, that, that banks have these excess reserves, they park at the Fed and they can call them up any second to, to start lending. Uh, it's it's not known how effective the Fed can actually be to to kind of make financial conditions worse. And and so They'll continue to hike at, at some point. Um, yes, the market will react and financial conditions will worsen. And what that means is that if it is more difficult to have access to credit, then the Fed may well slow down or pause. And in the recent correction that we had um, in the market, there was a little uptick in that. We just uh, uh, published a, a chart book on the business cycle where we have a chart of that sort. Um, the US dollar is not a major concern to Powell. Kaplan of the Kansas Fed is referencing international trade in the dollar frequently, um, but um, he is a regional president. He does not call the shots. Um, trade is ultimately a small portion of the US economy. It's very relevant to emerging markets, obviously, what's happening to the dollar, um, but not to the Fed unless it comes back to haunt the US of what's happening in trade. Um, and, and, and clearly, there are some, some regionalized and local issues with regard to trade. And, um, but also, keep in mind, trade might um, trade war, a trade war might increase inflation, and so these are. It is not automatically clear that um, that every headwind we have to the U.S. economy is going to get the Fed to back up. Um, on the Fed balance sheet, um, we are, as of a few weeks ago, at the full pace of the quantitative tightening, um, reducing the balance sheet at a pace of 50 billion a month, and that's that's obviously noteworthy. The European Central Bank is is expected to to stop printing money at the end of the year. Now they'll continue to reinvest. There was a rumor out at the European Central Bank that they'll have another LTRO. That those were the long-term refinancing operations. I'm, I'm, for me, that's a, a given that they'll continue to have those things. They'll extend some of these programs. But still, that they, they'll keep the balance sheet stable with that. They're not going to increase it. The Bank of Japan similarly has um, has reduced its uh, its purchase programs. Um, but they haven't bought quite as much. This is the Fed dot plot. I'll have you listen to Nick on that and study that offline. Um, similarly, the, the statistics, I'm not going to go into too much. This is kind of the overview of the Fed. Again, please study that offline as to as to um, if, you, if you want to dive into details. And here is, is Nick's analysis on that. Um, my take, again, is that this economy is bound to overheat. 
this economy is bound to have interest rates that are higher than are currently priced into the market. Um, the market is currently, as of as of this talking here, um, pricing in a, a 90% um, chance of a rate cut in, in December. To me, that's that's a given. And then, uh, different from before the midterm election, we now have a chance um, of a little bit more than two rate hikes next year. But if you add it up kind of between this year, the 90%, and then the over two rate hikes for next year, um, that together kind of gives you the three rate hikes. And it's it's just a tad under three rate hikes um, f from December and then to next year. Now, to me, um, four rate hikes next year up perfectly plausible as well um, and and so it really depends of course on, on many many factors but I would not think that the Fed is necessarily going to say all right um, we're going to hike twice and then we'll see what's going to happen and the reason is that inflation metrics will pick up they will see that oh, employment cost index other metrics will move higher and that means the Fed will not just say hey no we'll pause here um, the one key thing to watch here is not the S&P, it is uh, the credit market, it is high yield spreads, it is, um, it's the sort of thing that, that might clog uh, the economic engine. And if that doesn't happen, then I would not be surprised if we can get up to four rate hike next year. Um, so um, I'll wrap it up here. Make sure you download the chart book, listen to Nick's analysis, look at the premium charts, go to MerckInvestments.com forward slash research, and also go to our website to, to see the other sort of services that we offer, um, including those on, on allowing you to take positions on the rates. Um, have a good one.